and I'm going to disappoint some of you who are thinking they're here for a motivational speech. You ain't getting it here, I'm afraid. You are not getting a motivational speech from me. What you will get is education. I'm an educator. See, the problem with motivation is, is it comes and goes. And if you rely on motivation, it means that I will only act if I am motivated. And that is not how the top 3% behave. So, like I said, I'm an educator. I would rather educate people in how to run their businesses. And that might be inspiring for them. They might feel motivated as a byproduct, but being motivated on its own isn't enough. In fact, if you motivate an idiot, all they do is stupid things faster. You need to educate people on how to operate and how to think so that they could be a much more successful entrepreneur. So if you came here for a pump up motivational speech, hopefully I've talked you around that maybe that's not what you want and you're still here and you'd like to hear um, what the top 3% of performers in any sport, in any business per, uh, situation, how they think and feel and how they behave. So we're going to do that. Anybody that's in the auditorium, I'm going to do a workshop in a bit and it would be great if you could come into the Zoom room and interact with me in that way. And actually, if there's some people in here, if you're not all in the auditorium, we could do some live coaching for the workshop as well. So I'd love to have some of you come through from the auditorium. So the first thing I'd like to talk about today is the um, way that successful people think. There's two different types of thinking that happen um, and I want to share those with you. We've got a line here, this is called the line of choice uh, and you are, people are either above the line or they're below it. Now below the line we have denial. Now there's two different types of denial. The first type of denial is um, conscious denial. It's like, I, 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 I kind of know, but I don't want to find out. For example, um, the stereotypical failing business owner who, is, um, who doesn't open his letters from the bank to see how overdrawn he was, or somebody um, who goes, I don't want to look in my bank account towards the end of the month before payday, because I just don't want to know how bad it is. That's conscious denial. It's a bit like a, you know, a manager or a business owner who doesn't want to go and speak to that team member and find out how they're doing in their, in their, in, in their job role because they feel uncomfortable with conflict and they don't want, to, don't want to actually have to deal with the problem. So they're staying con in conscious denial. Their, their purpose is like this, going, la, 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 I don't want to know. The other type of denial is unconscious denial. And that's a little bit more dangerous, like you don't know what you don't know. Now, you may have met somebody like this in your career at some point. Um, somebody who says things like, um, if it wasn't for me, um, this business would fall apart, apart around the seams. If it wasn't for me, nothing would get done around here. Now, if you can think of that person, you're probably thinking, yeah, I know that person. And they were the worst bloody performer in the business. And that's because either they used to be a good performer or because they, they work long hours or they seem to be doing a lot of stuff, they feel that they contribute a lot to the business. When actually, you know, you and I know that they don't. They're in denial. They just don't know that they are not performing on, the le on, on, on that level. Um, and we're all in various parts of denial about ourselves. Uh, at the back end of last year, I found myself in denial about my tummy. And I, I, the denial, it sounds ridiculous now, but the, the denial was that I, um, I said, I, I, I've got, I found equilibrium, equilibrium that I could just about do enough exercise so that I can enjoy my red wine and my steak at the weekend and a barbecue. And I found equilibrium. I'm not getting any bigger and I'm not getting any smaller. And, and if you're listening to this, you're probably chuckling because you know exactly where that was going. Um, I just didn't feel I was getting any bigger, but I was getting a pound, pound a month heavier. And over six months, over a year, that adds up. And then all of a sudden I looked in the mirror and went, and I came out of denial quite quickly at that point so then i went to the next place 
Excuses. Excuses. Oh, me back. I can't exercise as much as I used to. I'm not, I'm not as young as I used to be. That is an excuse which I'm, I, I thought of, but I immediately got past because I'm used to this way of thinking that I understood that that was an excuse. One of the biggest excuses that clients give me, uh, and they know, they know they're doing it at the time, is I didn't have time. I didn't have time. And I wonder if there's anybody watching this that says, that, that has, has recognized that in themselves. Oh, I haven't got time to do that. And important things just get pushed down the line and down the line and down the line. In fact, one of the most important things that I, I do with my clients is all those things they've been putting off that aren't urgent, but are really, really important. I get them to do them and I hold them accountable to do them. And that's really important because I don't, I don't hold up for their excuses. And I have this button on my desk that I will press if, um, if I hear one of those excuses. Now, um, you know, the time excuse, it is an excuse because I, I know you've probably all heard of Elon Musk. Now, Elon Musk is um, a very, he's running five companies, I think at the moment. And from, I think it's about seven in the morning to about eight at night, he splits his entire day up into no more than four, seven or 10 minute sections. And throughout the day, he um, absolutely, he, he, um, he will not take a meeting that's more than 10 minutes. You know, when I talk to clients who say they haven't got any time, they're having meetings that are lasting an hour and a half, two, two hours sometimes. Uh, and, you know, if you really push for time, you could get it done in half an hour. Um, he gets it done in 10 minutes. Can you imagine how many decisions and things you'd have if you don't do anything more than four, seven and 10 minutes and your whole day is structured in that way? Now, I don't know about you, that doesn't sound like an awful lot of fun to me. Um, but if I'm here and Elon Musk is there, I reckon we can all come that way a little bit so that we could get, we could improve on our productivity. We can cut out waste. We can make a, an hour's meeting, a half an hour meeting. We can find the time to do things. So sometimes when people come out of excuses, they go to the next level, which is blame somebody got in the way or something got in the way of me doing what I, what I intended to do. We blame Brexit, we blame um, the economy or coronavirus and all those kind of things. And, um, you know, it sounds really harsh sometimes when in, your re in the reality, it seems like an impossible thing to move forward in certain circumstances, like I've got so much empathy for, for fishermen at the moment who, whose entire businesses were, 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 were to export to, to, to Europe. And, and, and the, 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 you know, the Brexit thing has completely killed it. Now, you know, tough love says, if you want to have an income, if you want to have a job, if that job is no longer there, you need to re-educate yourself. Maybe you could repurpose the ships to do something else. Maybe sell the ships and buy into something else and retrain. But what you can't, well, you can, but you shouldn't do is sit there for the rest of your life in poverty, moaning about Brexit, because that is not going to help. So you need to move past it at that point and realize that you're blaming um, an, an, a, a, a circumstance or you're blaming it a person. Uh, one thing um, I hear quite often is people blaming their customers for not getting it or not being the right kind of customer. Um, one of the things I, I empower people to do is charge what they're worth to their customers so they charge a really good price. And the business owner is normally the person who is most feared in that respect. Um, and what I'll do is, 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 especially in a smaller business who's massively undercharged, We'll try and put our prices off. I remember somebody saying to me once, Jeff, oh, you don't understand. In my industry, it's different, right? Well, that's an excuse. I get a pound every time I hear that one. Um, but everybody in this industry, that's a generalization. That's also not true. Uh, everybody in our business, they're just after the cheapest. They're just after the cheapest. They just want price. They don't care about anything but price. To which I asked him, you know, did you buy the cheapest shoes? Do you buy the cheapest cars? Do you go buy the cheapest holidays? And maybe on one of those things, the answer might be yes, but certainly not on all of them. 
to people buy on value. And actually, when I went on this person's website, it said, will be any price, 10% discount before you've even asked for it, which isn't a discount, is it? Let's face it. And it's just said cheap, cheap, cheap. So they were just attracting cheap people and then blaming them for being cheap. So that's the sort of thinking that we have that is below the line. Uh, and you might know somebody who um, is constantly below the line, moaning, blaming, whining about stuff. And you think to yourself, why on earth do they stay with that kind of thinking? But actually it's important because that, that kind of thinking is comforting for people. Because if you are below the line, what you do is you create a victim mentality. It's being done to me. There's nothing I can do about it because it's out of my power to change it. And if it's out of my power to change it, I don't need to have the courage to do anything about it because it's out of my hands. I'm a victim to my circumstances. And if you find yourself in that place, then you need to readjust your thinking quite quickly um, if you want to get some better results. So let's look at what is above the line. Responsible. Well, I, I apologize for my handwriting just once per session, by the way. Um, responsibility is the ability to respond to something. So responsibility is a two stage process. Firstly, you have to be aware of what's going on. And secondly, then you need to step in and do something about it. So you're responding to the things around you. So, for example, if one of you good people was to make me responsible for a small pet of yours or, or a child, I would need to monitor its behavior in um, in the relation of anything that might hurt it. Um, and then if it's about to stick its fingers or its paws in the plug socket, then I need to respond and step in and do something about that. That's why responsibility is the opposite of denial. Because if, you, if you're not aware, then you can't do anything about it. So accountability. Accountability is the ability to hold yourself to account. So that is then uh, accountable for the outcome, not the action. So people who are in responsibility mode, they'll do the thing. Like a salesperson, I made my 50 sales calls. But if they're in accountability mode, they will, they'll be focusing on the appointments they needed to make or the sales they needed to make. So instead of saying, I made my 50 sales calls, I'm going home, they'll go, I'm not going home until I get my four appointments. So that's holding yourself accountable to the outcome. And the top one ownership. You literally own the ship. Um, I remember sitting down with um, a, a business owner. We were having a conversation to see if we were going to work together. Um, and um, he said, oh, you don't understand, Jeff, in my industry, that's a pound, um, you can't get any good staff. And the ones that you can get, they don't do as they're told, they get everything wrong and they mess it all up and they don't care. Uh, and I know that whenever team aren't performing, there's only one of three problems. So I asked him, who hired them, who trained them and who manages them? And the answer to those questions was me, I hired them, nobody trains them, and I manage them. And at some point, you've got to take ownership of that, that if you've got team in your business, instead of blaming them for being no good, you either need to get, if they're, if they're not performing and they're the wrong person in the wrong seat, then you need to be moved into another job within the business, or they need to be moved into another job outside of the business. If it's just that they're, they're, they're not skilled enough, you need to train them. If it's because they've got confused or they've not understood what the job is properly, you need to manage them properly. But at any point, if the team that works for you is not performing, the first place you need to look is here. And if you work hard with them, 
um, and you, uh, if you work with them and you move um, quickly through those management recruitment problems, then you will find that you get a lot better um, improvement with your team. So the thing about above and below the line thinking is this. If you, um, you're thinking, right, I've shown you, Jeff, show me this thing and it makes sense. And am I now supposed to always be above the line? Well, the answer to that is no, because actually your, your brain is designed to go here first. So you can give yourself a little bit of breathing space. If you find yourself making an excuse or blaming other people, your brain's doing what it's designed to do because your brain is designed to keep you alive, keep you safe and conserve energy. Think of that in a workplace when, you know, the proverbials hit the fan, something terrible has gone wrong. Most people's reaction is to protect themselves and they'll protect themselves through these things. It wasn't me, Gov, I didn't do it. And that is the brain naturally doing what it's supposed to do. But, all, but, but we need to, uh, as a higher level of evolution, our brains were designed thousands and thousands of years ago. Um, as a higher evolution of people now, we need to retrain our brains so that we, even if we do dip there first, that we can recognize it and then we can move up there. Those of you who have teams that you're working with, very important that you also don't send your team below the line. And I'll give you an example of that. So um, if you're a manager or a business owner and you said to someone, um, why did this happen? Well, what are they going to give you? They're going to give you an excuse. If you say to them, who's responsible for this? They're going to give you blame. But if you ask him a really good quality management question, which would be, you know, hey, John, I see this thing happened last week. That wasn't ideal. What do you think you can do? Um, give me three ideas of things that you can do next week to make sure that, that doesn't happen again. And you pull them immediately above the line. So it's very important that as a manager and a leader as well, that the way that we structure our questions doesn't push people below the line. I remember one person that I met once, I saw him with his team and to save his team time, he made their excuses for them. I remember him patting somebody on the shoulder uh, who hadn't done a piece of work. He patted them on the shoulder and said, oh, did you run out of time? And the person went, yeah, oh yeah, I ran out of time. Thanks for feeding me the excuse um, and that's what happens is that they get fed the excuse and um, they'll just won't perform at that level so that is the first part of inside the mind of a top three percent is recognizing when you're below here because if you think you're not below the line then you're definitely in denial because you'll go there sometimes Everybody goes there from time to time on an hourly basis in some cases. So firstly, it's recognize when you're below the line and then move up and spend as much time in ownership as you absolutely can. That is the, one of the traits of the top performers in any sport, in any industry. There's one thing I really dislike about football um, is that the, 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 the managers afterwards blaming the referees all the time and not taking ownership um, of, of the team performance. Some of them do and some of them don't. I'm not going to name names, but I think you know, if you're into football, you know who the blame, blame artists are. So that is the first thing that is really important for you to think about if you want to perform at a really high level. Now, the second thing is to think about how you behave I said at the start of the talk that motivation is not going to get you through because you cannot be motivated every single day. It's just not, it's just not reasonable to expect that. And we become what we regularly do. So if we regularly are sloppy with things, we become a sloppy person. If we regularly let ourselves off the hook, 
um, and, and, and allow ourselves to, to be distracted and not fulfill the things that we commitments we make to ourselves, then we'll become that kind of person. Uh, if we are regularly fit and energized and we exercise and we eat well, we'll, be, we'll become that kind of person. And that is habits. And your habits are what make you who you are. And a habit is what's uh, the definition of a habit is um, a, a, a thing that you do automatically without even thinking about it. So the super successful work hard to develop their habits. They get up early, they exercise so they're energized for the day. They'll have a habit of daily learning and reading and daily thinking time where they'll sit quietly and just rather than just rushing headlong into all the chaos at work, they will stop and they will think and they'll create that habit. I have a daily habit that I go for a walk in the mornings just 10 or 15 minutes. Sometimes I listen to an audio book. Sometimes I'm just have my own thoughts. Um, and because it is now a habit, I feel um, my day doesn't start right if I don't do that. So these good habits are something that you need to work on to put in. And this is what I want to cover in the workshop and help you do that. So all habits are made up of a four-step process, good habits and bad habits. So the first thing is there's a cue. There's a cue, there's something that triggers the, in, the, um, the habit to happen. It's something that happens. Then we get a craving. The craving is the desire for the effect of whatever that thing is. And then we have a response, we do something and then we get the reward. Um, so with these things, which is a source of lots of people's bad habits, we you see, even I couldn't help checking my message there as, as I had it on my, on my phone. The cue is quite often seeing it or it beeps. or as you can see, a couple of little messages come up on the notifications. And the, the, that's the cue is you see it. Now, I have a bad habit that I'm working on getting rid of that is when I'm writing marketing emails or something like that, if I get stuck, that's my cue is I'm stuck on something. I get writer's block and that's my cue. And my craving is to not have to think about this marketing email uh, and, and to, to have a release somewhere else. So my response is I'll check LinkedIn for work um, and the reward is that I get a dopamine hit from, from, from looking at my phone and I'm distracted from having to think about that. So that is a, um, a bad habit that I need to get out of and I'm working on that. And when I'm writing marketing emails now, what I do is to get rid of the cue is I put my phone over there where I can't see it and hear it. Um, or I'll switch it completely off. And that really helps doesn't is, is sometimes I still kind of reach for it, but because I made it harder, then it, it, it takes longer. I can, I can defend myself against it. So what we're going to do today is do a bit of a workshop for these habits of how you can make these habits um, stick for you. So you can turn the good things into um, the good things into habits uh, and the bad things you can stop doing. We're going to do that right now. So you will need pen and paper, please. So get that ready because we're going to start thinking about it. I want you to start thinking about a good habit that you would like to introduce into your week. Something you would just do on habit like my morning walk um, or some people just have, a, have reading time in the morning or something like that. Or it might be something in your business where you have a habit of making sure that you check your finances every day and not getting distracted with other things. So everybody's on the call, just take a minute to think of a good habit that you would like to have happen all the time. Maybe it's something you do occasionally, but you would like to do it a lot. And then we're gonna go through four laws that are gonna teach you how to do that. So pen and paper ready. The first law is to make it obvious. So if you want to introduce something into it, make it obvious. 
So for example, when I was starting my morning walks, um, I really wanted to start walking and it was actually winter when I, when I started doing this. Um, and I knew I had an orange jacket that was like a high vis because where I lived at that time, there was no footpaths and it was dark and I wanted to go out in a high vis jacket so I didn't get run over. Um, and the first morning I woke up and I went, where's that jacket? Oh, I don't know where it is. Do you know what? I'll have an extra half an hour. And I didn't go for a walk. The second day, same. Third day, same. The, uh, the end of the third day, when I got home and it was light, I went into the shed, dug out all the, threw all the gubbins in there, and I found the jacket. And then I put the jacket on the hook, on the back of the door, with my trainers, ready to go. Before I went to bed, I put my shorts and a jumper or whatever I wanted to wear for the walk in the morning. So it was all laid out. And first thing, my alarm went, next day I went straight for a walk. So make it really obvious. There's another thing in the first law, which I would like to share with you, which is called habit stacking. So if you'd like to do that, it's, you, habit stacking is a habit that you already have that you, that you can stack another one on there. So when I get in my car, I will listen to an audio book. When I get in my car, I'll do my breathing exercises when I boil the kettle, um, I will, I don't know, whatever that habit is. When I um, get in the house, I will immediately put on my trainers, not my slippers. So you're something you're already doing, you're doing something on top of that, which makes it really easy to start the habit. So think about the habit that you're thinking about and then go, right, how am I going to improve that? How am I going to make the cue and make it obvious for that habit to start? So that covers off the cue. So for the craving, we want to make it, in, make it rewarding. So make it attractive. So um, to, to do that, think about your habit. How can you make it attractive? So there's a couple of things that you can do um, is you can change your environment so that the thing is enjoyable to do. So maybe that environment is people. So that your craving is you want to go and do that thing with somebody. So you join a running club to go to go and do the run. Or if it's a walk, you've got that's why a lot of people buy dogs, is so they can make it really enjoyable to go for that. I remember telling my doctor I went for a walk. She said, got a dog? And I went, no. And she looked at me very strangely. Um, just because I went for a walk every morning without a dog. Uh, but really, the second one is to make it really attractive, really create that craving of, uh, of understanding why it is that you want to do that. So that's also about thinking about the outcomes from that. You know, if the habit is a work related habit of checking your profit and loss account or checking your sales figures, checking your marketing statistics to know if your marketing campaigns are working. The reward of that is that you will make more money. So try and associate that with that. So the third one, reduce friction. Make it really easy. Prime the, prime the environment. So like I said earlier, leave your trainers out if that's the thing. Always have your gym bag in the car. Maybe you have two gym bags so that, you know, when one, one lot's in the wash, you've still got another lot. But also in this area, we're looking at making it really, really easy. So it's called the two minute rule. So rather than, than say to yourself, I want to have a habit of going to the gym and doing a two hour workout until I could barely walk and my hands shaking completely. Your brain's thinking, oh, I'm not sure about that. Actually, what is the habit? The habit you probably need to get in the hang of is turning left instead of turning right on the way to or from work. So you've got your gym bag in the car. I just, all I need to do is I need you to turn left to the gym instead of right to home. Because once you've turned left, you're going to the gym and you're going to work out. You don't need to think about the whole workout. You just need to turn left. So that's the thing that people make out. They say, right, what I've got to do is I've got to work out two, time, two hours a day, five days a week. And no, just turn left. 
just turn left three or four times a week and you're all good. So the fourth law is make it satisfying. So reward yourself for all that. So you can set targets for yourself and say, if I do this every day for a week, I'm going to have um, champagne instead of, instead of Prosecco this weekend. Um, the other way that you can reward yourself is by, um, um, by tracking, you know, ticking things off lists, a very satisfying thing to do. Now, next to my spin bike in the garage, I've got one of these and every day I track how many calories, uh, how many miles and how many minutes I do on that. Um, and I've habit stacked that and made it really, really enjoyable because I've got a 42 inch DVD player in front of, in front of the bike and, um, and I get on my bike uh, and I watch movies and I love it. Uh, and that's part of my evening now. If you just said to me, yeah, Jeff, go in the garage and just sweat away for 45 minutes on a spin bike, I would definitely say no, especially once the kids are in bed about eight o'clock on my energy is declining. I'm just not going to do that. But because I've stacked it with watching DVDs in the garage, really enjoyable, I, something I look forward to doing. So the other thing is sometimes people get disheartened when they miss a day. You know, I meant to, uh, you know, I, I meant to have salad every day, but this cake was right there and I just ate it. So it's important not to beat yourself up and say, do you know what? Um, just, you had the cake, you ate it, whatever. Just put a cross on, on that day, but don't miss twice. Get back on the wagon, get back on the bike, get back on whatever it is that you're doing and make sure that you increase those, you keep those habits going. And that's how you can increase habits over time. Excuse me, my mouth's getting a little bit dry. So your habits form your identity. Your identity is who you feel you are as a person. Um, it's really, really important to shape your identity. Your, your ident you, you probably have met people who are, um, uh, you just seem super successful and they just seem to swan into a room like they own it, not in an arrogant way, but just, they just feel that, 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 that they're okay with that. And that's because their identity says that they're a successful person and, and the things that, that happen, that, that, that they have happen, that they want to happen, happen. And that's their identity and that's, that's, that's what happens. You know, sometimes um, you notice some identity level actions or statements would be you know, if you take somebody who's not used to going to really expensive restaurants and they go to a really expensive restaurant, like my, my, my wife's grandma, bless her, um, you take her to a really nice restaurant and they get fussed over. And because they're not used to that, they're like, oh, thank you. Oh, if it's not too much trouble, could I possibly have a knife and all this kind of thing? Uh, and, they, and, and they feel almost awkward around that. It's interesting because when uh, my wife's grandma, she, she, um, she's unfortunately, she's got dementia, she's in a home now. Um, and the first home she went to was really, really nice. And she's like a working class Hampshire lass and, um, and she had a very simple taste. And she felt like she was in a posh hotel in this, in this place. And that she's actually moved to another place, which is, they're great there. They really look after her, but that it suits her identity it's, it's like a converted house it's much smaller and she feels much more at home there because that's that's what her identity level is now if we have an uh, if we regularly are overeating if we're regularly ignoring things in our business because we um, feel uncomfortable around conflict and we're regularly letting our team off the hook and not challenging them uh, on the things that are doing right, that that will lead into our identity, I can promise you. And I bet you, if you're really honest with yourself right now, you can relate to that. Think about how um, um, the more you do something, the more comfortable you with it and it becomes part of you. That's why it's so important to, to, to really work on your good habits and then get rid of your bad habits. And one thing with, with the bad habits, by the way, we haven't got time to cover it today, but what you do with the bad habits is you do the exact opposite of everything I just taught you to do for the good habits. So instead of making it easy, you make it harder. Yeah, so instead of 
um, like the easy, the easy version of that is don't have cake in the house because it makes it easier. They say fitness starts in the supermarket, not the gym. And that's exactly it. You know, if cake's in the house, I'm eating it. So don't buy cake, make it harder. So that's how you get rid of bad habits. But those, those, those habits shape your identity. And then you will just expect certain things to happen. And those, those shape your actions. So you will just behave in the way um, um, that a super successful person behaves. Now, I, I have a concept that I call boxes of expectations. And um, everyone's in a box of expectations of some sort. And it's, it's a certain size. Some people's expectations for themselves, their life and the experience they're going to have are bigger than the other ones. Um, and I remember years ago, I was, um, I was a nightclub manager at the time and I thought I was earning reasonable money, you know, and I was probably in a 50,000 pound box of expectations. Now it's not all about money, uh, but it's really easy to quantify in this respect. So I'm gonna use that as an example, but it might be about ability, you know, for sporting people. Um, a footballer might be in a box of expectation. He might say, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, a third division player. Uh, and, and he will behave like he's a third division player because his identity is like a third di division player. And maybe his habits are, because I'm only a third division player, I'm not a trainer, so not like all the time. I, you know, I'm just gonna have a good time in between matches. I'm not gonna train. Whereas you know, Ronaldo, um, famous for everybody else finishes, his habit is then get a, get a bunch of balls and go and do a thousand uh, um, uh, free kick practices afterwards because his habit shakes his identity. His habit of regularly training his butt off means he knows he's a winner. So that, and then when he gets on the pitch, because that belief is there, it's instinctive, he behaves in that way. And of course, there you go, Ballon d'Or is one of the best players in the world. And I'm not here for a debate on that over the Messi-Ronaldo thing, if anyone wants to call me on that. But those results are super important and they feed back to your identity, which leads everything. And your habits are one of the main drivers in that. So that is the end of my presentation today. Um, I really wanted to give an insight into the, the mind of a top 3% player because there's so much information out there and there's so many so much of it i think is maybe not deliberately but misleading that you have to be motivated and inspired to do this discipline and consistency are the things that really um, make people successful not inspiration it's the time that when you do something when you don't feel like it that's the time when you're really winning because our Motivation and our moods just naturally do that. And if our uh, performance mirrors that, we'll be hot sometimes, cold sometimes. And if you can get consistency and discipline through habits, then no matter what your mood does, your performance will be consistent. And that consistent performance will lead to a successful business, successful relationships, successful health, fun life, and wealth. So if you've enjoyed what you've heard today, um, I'd love to engage with you further. Um, I'm holding an event actually with my friends at the Metro Bank um, next week on finance. We've talked today about mindset. A big part of my work is how I make business owners um, more successful and, and more wealthy. So what I'm talking about on this event next week is about how to um, how to cr um, make your business more profitable, even without any extra customers. That comes later when we talk about marketing. So if you'd like to come to that event, or you've just had a you've enjoyed being on here, and you'd just like to get a, a, a 20 minute chat with me just to see maybe if we, for a good fit for us to work together or something, then you can email me on jeff at jeffshrimpton.com um so that's jeff at jeffshrimpton.com not very imaginatively title email address or web address but i would love to hear from you if it's if you've got some feedback from the webinar i'd love to hear what your biggest learning was pop me an email get in touch 
and um, we can either have a call. I, I can invite you to that. I am allowed. It is a Metro Bank um, customers event, but I am allowed to invite a certain amount of people because I'm the presenter. Um, so if you'd like an invite to that event that show you, I can show you how to make your business much, much more profitable. I would love to hear from you. Uh, I know most people here are streaming on YouTube, maybe watching this retrospectively. Uh, the date for that event is the 28th of July, uh, 1 p.m. If you'd like to come to that, just email me and I will send you an invite. Uh, those of you are uh, live, if you want to, I, I'm here for another 10 minutes or so. If you would like to jump into um, the Zoom room, if you've got any questions for me, do a bit of a q and I'm happy here to, to wait here if anyone wants to jump from the um, auditorium into the Zoom room. There's a little button at the front. Otherwise, thank you for listening. I really appreciate you being here with me today. Uh, I hope you've learned something um, and I hope um, the less that you apply the lessons that you've learned today because I know they'll make a massive impact on your life.